Shila Prabhupada, Jai Gauda Pramada, Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya, Namo Bhagavati Yeah, I'm just on the road, I'm just on the 
almost as hard as pronouncing Mer Willing. Nita Nita Jasanvior. Someone else want to try? Nothing. 
So an exciting? Would you like to go? Maybe if you're like really burnt and stressed, you just want to go in the room with nothing. But after a while, you know, you get kind of tired of nothing. And so it's, it's a bit like that. I've merged into I've merged into the unlimited nothingness. Okay, you know, what are you going to do now? Hmm, nothing. <laughs> Sounds boring, doesn't it? Especially if you're a kid, really boring. Mm. <clears throat> the devotee has only to hear about devotional activities, which are as simple as anything in ordinary life. In other words, Prabhupada's saying, okay, if you want to attain a stage of realizing that you and God and everything are one, you have to become completely free from desire and attain this stage of equanimity. And just like, nothing bothers you. That's very difficult. The Prophet said, but all you have to do is hear him. Hear. If you're a devotee, you hear Bhagavatam and anybody can do it. And it's easy. Because what Prabhupada is saying here is, um, which is, which, um, the devotee has only to hear about devotional activities which are as simple as anything in ordinary life. In other words, in ordinary life we're hearing about something. So you just change what you're hearing. It's not like a big deal. And he also acts very simply, whereas the mental speculator has to pass through a jugglery of, wor jugglery of words, which are partially facts and partially a make show for the maintenance of an artificial and personal status. <clears throat> In other words, he's saying philosophically it's um, very difficult. And it's especially difficult philosophically to understand something that isn't true and try to make it look like it's true, kind of, sort of. And we're not really one. Everything is not one, it's one and different. And so we are different. And so to try to philosophically make sense that it's only one and not different. The prophet uses the word juggling. You have to juggle words around. That by juggling words you can bewilder people and get them to believe something that's not true. Right. I was saying the other day that that a lot of the impersonalist teachers, nobody can understand it, and that's why people think they're so great. They think that this is very esoteric, very high stuff. I'm not qualified to understand it. But actually no one's qualified to understand it because what they're saying is doesn't make sense. But people don't know that. They just think, oh, this is deep stuff. I can't understand it. Yeah. Well, the guy speaking it can't understand it either. If he could, he could explain it. But he, I'm you, you're me, it's all one. Like, what? No. It's like, no, it's not. I'm not you. If I'm you, give me your money. No, I'm not going to give you my money. Well, we're all one. That's the problem. That's the famous Sankirtan line when you meet someone who says, We're all one, so I'm one with your money, so give me all your money. No, no, I can't do that. There was a, there was a devotee, he was sleeping. Somehow they ended up in an ashram, impersonalist ashram in India. And they were speaking, you know, everything is one, and my shirt, my this and that. It's, you know, there's no difference between anything. And then it came time to sleep and it was really cold. So the devotee who was arguing with this person said, well, since it's all one, here's a thread from your blanket and I'll take your blanket because I don't see it's one. I see this blanket will keep me warm and this thread will. And the man said, no, 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 I need my blanket. So it's not a practical philosophy. Right? It sounds good, but the Prophet's saying, how can you understand something if it's not true and someone's trying to make it sound true? Yeah. Let's, I'll read it again um, so you can hear what Prophet said again. Um, and partially a make show for the maintenance of an artificial, impersonal, status. In spite of his strenuous effort to attain perfect knowledge, the impersonalist attains merging into the impersonal oneness of the Brahma Jyoti of the Lord 
which is also attained by the enemies of the Lord. That is very interesting, isn't it? So I'm, I'm doing austerity to attain a position that if I became an enemy of the Lord, he would give me the same position. Hmm, let me think about that. I'm getting, the, I'm trying to achieve a position that the enemies get. Like, there uh, must be something wrong here, right? And I have to trace back my steps and see what's going on. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Which is also attained by the enemies of the Lord simply because of their being killed by him. The devotees, however, attain to the highest stage of knowledge and renunciation and achieve the Vaikuntha Lotus, the planets in the spiritual sky. The impersonalist attains only the sky and does not achieve any tangible transcendence. Whereas the devotee attains to the planets where real spiritual life prevails. With a serious attitude, the devotee throws away all achievements like so much dust. I mean, material achievements. And he accepts only devotional service to the transcendental culmination. So there's a doing devotional service. I thought that was interesting. Of course, this verse is saying renunciation is a byproduct of bhakti and knowledge is a byproduct of bhakti. We were, we were talking yesterday how sometimes people may come here in a mood to kind of kick back and relax and not want to do a lot of service. Not devotees, but yes. Um, and so I, I told the devotees, I said, you should tell them this story, and I'll tell you the story it's a bit about service. About how, this is a story of how service produces knowledge. But there's like some things you could never understand unless you do service. It would be revealed through service. So this, took, this story takes place during the time of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Uh, a professor came to him, he had some questions, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, at the moment, I'm busy, but you can see my disciples, let's see if they can answer your questions. And then after that, you can come back and see me, see if you're satisfied. So he went to the disciples, the disciples had just finished doing puja, and they were washing the deity paraphernalia in the deity place. And the man said, I'd like to speak to you, and they said, uh, we can speak to you after we finish, but if you like, you can help us clean the place. He was probably a Brahmin or something. You know, it's India, like 150 years ago. So it's probably common that someone like that would say, yeah, okay, I'll do service. So the man did the service. And after they finished cleaning the plates, the devotee said, so would you like to ask questions? And he said, no, um, it's not necessary. Then he went back to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta and said, did my disciples answer your questions? He said, I got the answers while I was washing the plates. So that's an example here, what this verse is saying. That, uh, knowledge comes through service. So there, there are certain things this thing up here cannot understand, but this thing here can understand. The heart can understand it when it's purified. And that purification sometimes comes to the surface. And sometimes you just, aha, now I understand. Have you ever done a lot of austerity? Like, you know, book distribution like for 15 hours or service for 15 hours. You, you get very purified. I'm not saying we do that every day, but you get purified by it. And you get realization. You get lots of realizations, isn't it, when you do austerity? So that's proof. Um, and then the other point, which is, I think, important, um, maybe even more important in a sense, is that vairagya is a byproduct, not of intellectual realization. Vairagya is a byproduct of advancement. So, as we were saying at the end of class yesterday, sometimes we try to renounce beyond the level we're on, because intellectually we understand this would be good. And then the problem is, sometimes when we intellectually understand something, we think we've realized it when we haven't. We've just intellectually comprehended this is what should be done. But to be sustainable with renunciation, I have to be able 
to have some realization and advancement that can sustain it. Otherwise, intellectual, it can flip up and down. Because what happens one day if you're not like intellectualizing it and you're kind of feeling something different? Your intellect kind of went to sleep and your mind woke up and said, hey, let's do this. You lose that sense of renunciation, even though your mind or your intellect kind of wants to do it, but in, the, in your heart you feel something different and you can't sustain it. So, uh, we have seen what I call premature transcendence. You could call it artificial renunciation. I like the word premature transcendence, although it's not a Shastri. It's not a Shastri reference, but premature transcendence describes that I'm trying to renounce beyond my love, and it doesn't work, and then I always will come back, back to my level sooner or later. So I'm prematurely transcending. Now, it doesn't mean the goal has changed, it doesn't mean my intellect says, no, it's not a good idea, my intellect says, this is a great idea, let's go for it. But if I try to go too high, um, I will tend to fall back down. And so I'm trying to live too much away. So, the point that we're discussing here is bhakti produces renunciation. It's just, you can't, you can't renounce unless it's a byproduct of your advancement. It won't work. It's not sustainable. We've seen it a million times, and uh, we'll probably see it a million more times. And some people have to learn the hard way. But as leaders, when we guide devotees, we try to help them when they say, I want to do this. And you're like, uh, maybe you should wait to be a little more advanced, or you know, maybe let's take time and see. You know. So that's the idea. Um, as we mentioned in class two days ago, Prabhupada likes to speak about impersonalists. Well, actually, he doesn't like to speak about it. He likes to um, reveal their misunderstanding. And we said, if you may remember, we said that the reason sometimes Prabhupada would become upset was, it was because he, out of his love for Krishna, that these philosophers are denying the form of Krishna, and so naturally he becomes upset. But there's another reason Prabhupada becomes ups upset. And uh, Prabhupada said something very heavy, which uh, don't faint after I say it, because I'll explain it. And I was there when he said it, and I, I forget the context, but maybe I do remember the context. You know this book, Life Comes From Life. You've seen that book? You have it? Yes? No? The conversations between Srila Prabhupada and, and basically Sri Damodar and about science, the word, modern, modern scientific theory. And these conversations happened when I was living in Los Angeles. They happened in Los Angeles. I was even on one of those morning walks. And so what was happening is Surup Damodar, at that time he was not a, a Maharaj, he was doing his PhD. And so now Prabhupada had someone to bounce, bounce ideas off of. Like what, what are they saying? What are they thinking? What is their goal? What is, and so forth. And so Prabhupada was instilling within him this idea that these people are misleading the whole society because they're the, most, the scientists are the most respected. Of course, Prabhupada is generalizing. Not every scientist is misleading. Not every scientist is a <clears throat> evolutionist, an atheist. But speaking general, because that was the that's where it was going. And if you read. Um, textbooks, at least in those days, I don't know now, but evolution, evolution was considered a fact, and any other religious idea was considered religious faith. So you have fact, and you have faith, right? So faith means it's not a fact, and fact means it's not faith. It is a fact, and you have faith in something else without a fact, which is totally untrue. They didn't have any facts to prove anything. <clears throat> and so we were kind of asleep at the wheel, and then Prabhupada starts bringing it up. Starts bringing these things up. So like every morning on the walk, 
Fox Clear talking, that whole, all that book was just one conversation, morning walk after another in Los Angeles. And uh, it was at that time Prabhupada formed the Bhaktivedanta Institute, and he, his idea was, we need to explain to the scientists the Bhagavad philosophy in their terms, so it must be done by scientists. If you're not a scientist, sometimes they can run circles around you. Now, I lived in San Diego where um, Sadaputa, who was a genius scientist, was writing his books, and Jutakarma also, working with Sadaputa. They wrote that book, Forbidden Archaeology. And we used to go to university, <clears throat> and it was a high, it was a, it was a medical school, so a lot of biology, so you get to the biology classes, and it's all evolutionary biology. And so that's what they were all indoctrinated in. And I pretty much fell asleep in all my science classes, so I couldn't really, I wasn't up on all the theories and the jargon and the lingo and so forth. But when Sadaputta spoke to them, oh my God, it was so fun to watch. Because they think all oh, these Hare Krishnas are just a bunch of whatever, you know. And they're coming up with all their theories, you know, that they learned in school. And I swear, I saw people talk to Sadaputta and turn red when he started talking because they realized, I'm talking to someone who knows like 10 million times more than I do and is 10 million times smarter. They didn't know it until about 30 seconds after he started speaking. And I, I just watched it. It was beautiful. And they'd be like, shrinking. <laughs> So, um, so that was the environment, and so in this lecture that will cause you to faint, um, is a very heavy statement. Prabhupada said the scientists are the greatest enemies of modern civilization. Whoa. Okay, let's unpack that. What did he mean? From Prabhupada's perspective, the worst possible thing that could happen to a human being is to either think, you're God, or there is no God. And so, voidism and impersonalism, right? That, in Prabhupada's mind, is the absolute worst thing, because that will destroy the sense of submission to God, and service to God, because there is no God to serve. And if there's no God to serve, I'm not small. I can become as big as I want, because there's nobody big. You know, potentially I can be everything. So Prabhupada saw that, um, what they're teaching to, will destroy the very sense of service to a supreme being. And number two, the scientists are the most respected people in society. And how do we know this? What's the latest scientific theory? You know, they have protons, neutrons, then what else did they find? Higgs boson. What? Higgs boson. Oh, that's a new one. I haven't heard of that. What do they call it? Higgs boson. What is it? It's like the missing L, the missing part which governs how those items are Yeah, connected. yeah, okay. The Higgs, Higgs boson. Higgs boson. They smash the particles together. Okay, so you'll go to school and read the Higgs, about the Higgs boson, but you've never seen one. No. And you never will, unless you have a Higgs boson microscope that only costs four million dollars or something like that. Can they see it? Or are they speculating or they actually see it? They have the machine. They in Switzerland, a big circle. Collider, and about 20 kilometers in diameter. Oh. It's a bit more than four minutes, I'd say. Oh, uh, okay. Well, there'll be a new one made in China soon for $25. <laughs> <laughs> pocket, right? um, so, the point was that everybody's believing things that they have no access to prove on their own. And, and they're saying, you guys believe in God, you can't see God. And they're believing all these things that, that you know, some scientists have somewhere said. And um, some, some anthropologists, some science teachers, when they take a leave of absence for too long a time, they lose their job because they're not acquainted with the new ideas and what they used to teach isn't even true anymore. So this, this is going on. This is the context. So, Prabhupada sees, okay, they're putting forward this idea there's no God, and they're the most respected people on the planet. That's really dangerous. Now, I don't know if you know this, but it was around, must have been around 1970, 
Namdeva, I don't know why this devotee knew this, but you have Prabhupada's prana mantra, the Maum Vishnu Vadaya, Krishna Prasadva. So that's a generic prana mantra for the Guru. But Gurus also have personal mantras, uh, prana mantras, which describe them. And we, we didn't have one, and nobody was qualified to write it. So the devotee, as I was told, asked Prabhupada, can we have a, uh, a sec? I don't know if you call it a prana mantra or there's another. Does anybody know that personal mantra that has another name? Prana mantra number two. Anyway, he said we can. Can we have a personal prana mantra? And Prabhupada said yes. And guess who wrote it? Prabhupada. Which is significant. Why? Because he is stating in that prana mantra what his mission is. So let's just analyze it. It's very interesting because we say it every day and until you actually analyze it, you don't really get the depth or import of it. Namaste Saraswati Vedana. The servant of Saraswati. And that's so proper. It's defining who his identity. My identity is I'm the servant of my guru. That's not nobody else. And that, you know, the servant of the guru, the mission of Bhakti Siddhanta is my mission. Namaste Saraswati Deve. Gauravani. No, I have another. Gauravani Pachana. I got mixed up with Bhakti Siddhanta's. Gauravani. Gauravani. The words of Gora. Pacharani. What are the words of Gora? What is, what is Prabhupada preaching? The highest love, that's the words of Gora. The words of Gora give you the highest, the highest frame. So, I am a servant of Saraswati who is teaching the highest theology because I'm giving you the words of Gora and Lord Chaitanya came to give the highest theology. Namaste, Saraswati, Deve, Gora, Manika, Chaitanya. Niri, Sesha, Voidism, Sunyavadi, in Perth, or, or, I forget which is which, but Voidism and Personalism. Shunya means zero, so that would be voidism. Niri Sesha, everything is, there's no distinction. Shunya body, like Buddhism and atheism. Um, Paschatya, Paschatya means, Paschatya this Italian means the West. The West is, you know, we're thinking India is full of it, and Prabhupada's thinking, no, I've come to the West, I see it everywhere. Maybe Prabhupada saw it worse than India. He's everywhere he went, and he saw it. So, this is Prabhupada in his mind, this is his mission. I've come to the West to give Mahaprabhu's teachings to a place which is completely infiltrated. Uh, there's a pandemic of voidism and personalism. So, he's seeing very clearly what's going on. We didn't see, and the scientists got put in that position because they're, they're teaching, there's no God. There's no soul. Okay. Great, there's no soul. What does that mean? If there's no soul, eat, sleep, and be merry, because it doesn't matter. There's no karma, right? Who's going to get the karma in the next life? There is no next life. So, you know, Prabhupada's looking at all this and goes, this will destroy human society. And he was so adamant about this. Do you know that when they formed the um, Bhaktivedanta Institute, Prabhupada said, whatever you need, I will give you. And he was giving them every month. Who knows how much money they got? Anybody know? From the BBT, Prabhupada gave them what they wanted. And they needed $10,000. And every month he gave $10,000. It was that important, Prabhupada. Um, so, very interesting. So, you know, you'll see in Prabhupada's books, Whenever there's impersonalism, atheism like that, he's like, okay, let's go. You know, he's, he's there. This is, this is the problem that we must um, deal with. Because if we don't, it will pollute the whole society. And this society without a sense of soul and God will be finished. There will be no morality, etc. So, Hare Krishna. That's, oh, there's one more point here. One more word um, hmm, that I thought was interesting. We have to find it. Oh yeah, 
Vishada Ashayaha. Ashayaha. With a greatly serious attitude. So Prabhupada refers to that. With a in the purple, with a serious attitude, the devotee throws away all achievements like so much dust. And he accepts only devotional service, the transcendental culmination. So it sounds like <coughs> what Prabhupada is saying is that when we become serious about bhakti, it's very easy to renounce. It's like, it's like, shh, it's like dust. It's like no problem. But when we're not serious, then it can be difficult because we're all attached. So what did Prabhupada say? Simple for the simple, complicated for the complicated. You know Sri Kirti's book, What's the Difficulty? You know where that statement came. It's like, sometimes the devotees would have problems and Prabhupada would give an instruction, which for us was, was like, oh, that's difficult. And for Prabhupada, it's like, what's the difficulty? The only difficulty is you don't want to do it. It's not difficult. So, so, so Prabhupada saw that, like, what is the difficulty? Well, one devotee asked Prabhupada, well, what is the difficulty? And Prabhupada said, you. You're the difficulty. There is no other difficulty other than you're you're in the way of yourself. So, <clears throat> man, that was a, just a common cliche for Prabhupada. What is the difficulty? And it was interesting also because we would think many things were difficult until Prabhupada said, "What is the difficulty?" And then we realized it wasn't difficult. It was like it was just our minds were making it difficult. And I always think I always think this when. I come to a temple and we're having a nice festival, a nice kirtan, a nice prasada, a nice class. Everyone's blissful. Or I was just in India, you know, at the dawn. And nobody's working and it's just all day here in chanting. Everyone is blissful. It's just when we're not doing that, that's when the difficulty comes. So Prabhupada's, you know, saying, well, when you do this, there is no difficulty. When you don't do this, there will be difficulty. And it's just, we have to accept that reality. Krishna consciousness is not difficult unless you don't do it. Then it's difficult. Something like that. So, <clears throat> you can renounce like dust. Everything is easy like, like to give up like dust. Or very difficult to give up if we're not uh, experiencing this nectar. And then the last thing this verse says is, if you drink the nectar of this Krishna Kata, you'll go back to Godhead. Akunta Dishyam is translated as Akunta Loka in the spiritual sky and the word before, Anvi you achieve. So, it's quite interesting if you have the opportunity to listen to Prabhupada's lectures, you will, you will hear in many lectures, Prabhupada will end with a statement or a phrase that sounds something like this. Blah, 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 and in the end, go back home, back to God. So my dear boys and girls, just take this process, be happy, and go back home, back to God in this lifetime. Like, something like that. He'll end the lecture like that. Like, okay. So, we may think, no, not in this life where it's difficult, I have desire, and I can't go back to God if I have desire. But Prabhupada was, no, no, he was just, do this process, you go back to God. So it seems like some paradox here between what Prabhupada thought and what we thought. And there are a few conversations that, that have been related to me, it's very similar, in which Prabhupada said 16 rounds, four principles, and you go back to God. Where devotees question Prabhupada, is that all? Is that true? Is there anything else? And of course there's a lot more, but Prabhupada choose, chose in these situations to say no. Not no, you don't do anything else, but 16 rounds, four principles, you go back to Godhead. And, and we might think, but I heard it takes three lives. Or I heard it takes five lives, or I'm not Krishna conscious, or whatever. So the devotees were asking Prabhupada, how is this? Like there was a doubt. Like, and Prabhupada, and two times I heard the stories that were different. Prabhupada either slammed his 
fist on the table, or raised his voice and said, 16 rounds, four principles, I promise I will take you back to God. Whoa. So that makes sense with the other things Prabhupada said, follow this process, and you will go back home back to God. But well, you're saying, oh, I don't feel I'm qualified. Prabhupada's saying, no, no, that's not, that's not the equation. The equation is I'm qualified to take you, so just hold on to the rope when I pull it, don't scream and kick. And I'll pull you. That's what Prabhupada's saying. So we're looking at it thinking, my qualification, I can't go back to God. And Prabhupada's saying, your qualification is hold on to the rope and I'll pull you. The rope is 16 rounds, four principles. Don't let go of those. You're on the rope. That's it. It's easy. You know, just keep doing the process and, and you allow me to pull you. Like sometimes at initiation, I, I kind of say in a joking way and said, my, my job is to pull you back to God and your job, the job of disciples not to resist, not to fight and scream and yell like a little kid. Or we have to go to school. No! And you're pulling and fighting. So the job of the disciples is you go along, you do the process, and the prophet says, I'll take you back to God. And some of you know there are many stories of devotees who left Prabhupada. And, and he Prabhupada came back to save them. And, and Prabhupada was asked, he said, yes, I will come back. I will never give up on you. Just don't make me come back. But, but I will not leave you. I will come back and take you. So that's Prabhupada's job. He's taking us. The only problem is whether we're letting go of the rope or not. But if we don't let go of the rope, he'll take us. And so that's why Prabhupada so many times said, Ended his classes and go back home back to the country. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. You're in the right place, ladies and gentlemen, with the right guru. You've got nothing to worry about. You just get your rounds done, be a good devotee, keep holding on to the rope, and you'll get there, even if you think you won't. Hare Krishna. So, anyone have any questions or comments? Yes. I'd like to mention how Prabhu taking back to that point of austerity. And for one who chants, then there is some understanding that chanting Hare Krishna is also an austerity. Chanting 16 rounds a day, not so austere, but some austerity. Yes. And from that, actually we should be able to see how things will problems will be solved if we let go of us trying to intellectualize it and see it from a broad spectrum broad-minded spectrum just to let go and actually let the lord let the lord show us how we can see it in different ways um, there was one other thing i wanted to mention and that was how with Namaste. Namaste can also mean without false ego. And therefore, when Prabhupada suggested in Bhakti Siddhanta, without false ego, which of course is, as you said, the servant. Thank you. When you approach the Guru, you can't approach with ego. You approach falling down like a stick, honey pot down. And that's why Prabhupada said, disciple always feels like a fool. A disciple should feel like a fool, because that's humility. I don't know anything. Thank you. Yes. Um, on the last, thank you for the class, but on the last point regarding Prabhupada saying, you will go home, back to God here. And even in this verse, it's Akunta Dishnyam, Vaikunta Loka, in the spiritual sky. Not just by like, Kunta Loka here. But we know that uh, that Lord Chaitanya's philosophy is Mama Janmani, Janmani Ishwari, like yeah. no, no birth, no liberation. This seems like some kind of desire for liberation or incentivizing liberation for us to perform devotional service. And Prabhupada would also use that as a. Yeah, so true. is this. But, is that some? Is that like a red herring for us, or is that something to, to look for? Is it all right for the birdies to go? You know what? I do want to go back because I'm done with this. Yeah, I think it goes back to the point I was making of premature transcendence. Because if 
if you have some material attachment and you say, I don't want to go back to Godhead, you know what Prabhupada said to a devotee who asked this question, who was in, in an immature state, he said, no, you should desire to go, because if you come back here, why would you come back? Unless you're completely pure, you'll come back to enjoy something here. And Prabhupada's goal is to get us back to Godhead, so if he wants us to go back to Godhead, we should go. Now, if you achieve this, a very high level of bhakti, you're already back to Godhead. And so then, for you it's like, whatever, wherever Prabhupada wants me to go, I'll go. It has to be natural. But, like you say, Prabhupada was encouraging us. And I think it's important that Prabhupada came here to deliver us, so he wants us to go back to Godhead. So that, therefore, if you take your desire to go back to Godhead as service to your guru, because that's what he wants from you, he wants you to become pure and go back to Godhead, then, then it's, not pers it's not, like you say, you know, motivated. It's motivated by a pure desire. And, you know, in, in, in immature state, we say a lot of things that don't make sense. Uh, I just want to come back birth after birth. But you know, you just went to the movies last night, so, you know, you can't say that. <laughs> we know why you want to come back, because you like movies. You know? That's why you want to come back. You don't want to miss anything. You know? Could be some good ones in your next life, with you know, the technology is getting better. So it has to be consistent with your realization. Um, I just want to, you know, save all the, you know, if you actually had prema, or Baba, you'd want to save everybody. You wouldn't want to go back. But that's that's natural. And then Krishna can use you that way. And if Krishna wants you to go back, you can't fight it. And if he wants you to preach, you'll be happy. But prior to that realization, it's a bit artificial. And I would say it's Prabhupada's desire. And I I researched this topic, and if you research it, what you say is true. We should only want to serve birth after birth, but predominantly Prabhupada's saying, go back to God, and we should have that desire. So I think that is a safer position until we're on a higher level. But anything less than that could be dangerous, because it's not... It's like a devotee saying, I'm, I'm lower than a worm in stool. But no, you're not. You, know, you can't say that, because you don't have prema. It doesn't make sense. Right? It's a similar thing. Uh, I just want to come back for that difference. Really? You're on that level? Maybe it's a sentiment, it's a desire, you know, I want to preach, you know, I feel that. Prabhupada wants me to go somewhere else. But what about the fact that he wants you to go back to God and what about your other material desires? Like I was saying the other day when Prabhupada said, you will come back in a family of devotees, but it doesn't mean you're going to become a devotee. You could get deviated. There's so many things to deviate us. Right? Who knows? You could fall in love with a robot. They might be really, you know, this is my theory, you know, people are going to marry robots because you can program them to say whatever you want them to say. So that you get home from work and the robot says, I'm so happy to see you, it's so good to see you, instead of, why are you late? Did you pick, I told you to go shopping, did you pick up, oh, I forgot, go back! And the robot is just like, robots will be better, so you know. We'll be, we'll be having attachments for robots. That'll be the big, you know, the big attachment in the future. I mean, we're, we're gonna, you know, we're so attached to our phones and there's like a little robot in there. So, you know, we're, we obviously are deeply attached to this world. We're deeply attached to this body and the enjoyment of this body gives. So to say, I just want to come back. That's okay <laughs> if you don't have that attachment. Sure, of course. Now we know your desire here, because you're completely free from that. But if you're not, then you know, maybe I should just go back to God and fulfill the desire of the Guru. Even though, I, even though, you know, if he doesn't want me to, that's fine. I'm happy. You know, if he wants to send me, you know, a 26 second avenue, you know, in the next life or wherever the next mission is. Prabhupada was asked, where are you going? What, what's your service? What do you want to do? He said, I want to preach in the hellish planets. So, you know, maybe he wants us down there. Okay, I'll go if he wants. But, yeah, yes. I was, I was going to say, amongst all of this discerning, it would be necessary to actually discern so to know 
know how we can rise above fear. I mean, we can't be motivated by just the fear. So it is necessary for us to discern. And a lot of that is based on proper proper attachment. We were just reading, John Mann was reading, you know, purple, by short proper, that there's nothing wrong with attachment. It's just that it has to be proper attachment, proper detachment. So the point I'm making is that, you know, with proper discerning, we can rise above acting out of fear. We don't want to find ourselves surrendering to Krishna just out of fear. We want to find it that we're seeing ourselves as a soul, connecting to mm -hmm. knowledge. Yeah. That's higher, but when you don't have it, fear works. <laughs> you know, to get you. It's like the original. You know, it's pain, pain. You don't want to surrender because of pain, but it works. You take it on a higher level, of course. You know, it's all about realization. It's like the higher realization, more bhakti, more pure motive, and so forth. But Krishna's, you know, he's kind. If we slip down, then he'll slap us. So it's not the best, but uh, at least we didn't fall into the pit. <laughs> when you put a few spears, we're going to jump in the pit until we saw there were snakes in it. We're like, oh, I guess I shouldn't. But if there weren't snakes, I would have. And Krishna put the snakes there. We need that also. But that's a, obviously a lower level because motive should be out of attraction, not out of repulsion. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of that, you know. I serve out of repulsion because I can't enjoy the material world, but if I could, I wouldn't be a devotee. So, it's just, you know, where we're coming from. Krishna's good at smashing us when we need it, just to keep us on the path. Yeah, yeah fear is a very low level of consciousness. It's far from love. But, Fear can be transcendental. As Prabhupada said, I'm afraid I'll fall into Maya. So I should be afraid of Maya. And you know, Prabhupada said, you Westerners are not afraid of Maya. They're not enough afraid. So, you, you know, also Prabhupada said, or maybe the Bhagavatam says, that the biggest fear a devotee has is forgetting Krishna. So that's good fear. Um, that's your question. Okay. Oh, yes. Can you give her the microphone? The Abba Maha Prasad is being eaten now, but you're getting the real nectar. So don't worry. Yes? I'm just wondering what the real definition of humility is, because sometimes it's seen as low level self esteem. Yeah. Um, the real definition of humility is God is big and I'm small. Because atheists, an atheist could be humble. You know, an atheist could say, You go in front of me. You know, but he doesn't believe in God, so his his humility is it's a material, it's material like a reflection. Because there can't be a real humility unless there's a supreme being to be humbled to. Like Arjuna didn't want to fight, so he looked humble. Right? I don't want to fight. This is bad. And Krishna said, "Fight," and Arjuna said, "I think it's a bad idea." Finally, Krishna convinced him to fight. And when he started fighting, that's when he became humble, because now he was doing what Krishna wanted. And before, he was being humble, but not doing what Krishna wanted, so he's not being humble. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's important. How do you get rid of, you know, like we say, Krishna, I am nothing. You please empower me, and then I can do something. That's humility. Whereas, whereas a person who doesn't have that consciousness, just thinks, I did it myself, I'm great. You know? I lifted myself up by my bootstraps or whatever, however they say, and I achieved success. Whereas a person who was spiritual said, I did it by God's grace. So that's the humility, knowing who's actually empowering me. Okay. So if you do something wonderful, and you think, this was Krishna's mercy or Guru's mercy, Prabhupada's mercy, that means you're humble. Yeah, I'm the man, I'm the woman. Everybody applaud me. That's pride. Because you're not recognizing where your power came from. That's why 
that's why you can't really say someone who's not a devotee can be humble in, in the true sense, of, in the spiritual. They can be humble in the material sense. But we wouldn't define humility that way. We can just be polite and nice and, you know. So as far as low self-esteem, um, you know, Krishna was Dravaraj, and he had a very high level of prema, and he said, I feel like I'm a lower than a worm in the stool. Someone with low self-esteem could feel that way also, you know, but there's a completely different reason they feel that way than how Krishna was Dravaraj felt that way. It's the nature of love that when you have love of Krishna, you see everybody is above you. Like everybody's better. So if you're a worm and stool, that means pretty much everyone's above you. You feel everyone's better. When you have low self-esteem, you want everyone to tell you that you're good, right? Tell, tell me I'm good, encourage me, because I feel bad. This is a completely different thing. And so people with low self-esteem are very much focused on how they feel, how they don't feel good about themselves. Someone who's humble is focused on Krishna. Oh, Krishna, I'm so far from you. I want you. I'm so fallen. But it's not neurotic, self-centered. It's centered on Krishna. Does that make sense? In the um, self-care workshop, we get into this in detail. We have a lot about it. The difference between um, humility and low self-esteem and shaming yourself and all this. So if you could come, it would really be helpful. You should all come. You don't come, I may never talk to you again. So you don't want that to happen, right? Yeah, we talk about it more. But if I have low self-esteem, it's I'm very focused on feeling low, but not in a humble way. Just my identity, my a per, humble person doesn't have low self-esteem. It's not. Prabhupada was the most humble. He said I didn't do anything, but he was bold. But he always felt my guru emotions to me. Low self-esteem, I feel like I can't do this, you know, people won't like me, and, and that's a, it's a, it's a psychological, emotional problem. It's not a humility problem, right? So when you see these high levels of humility, those are, those are, we can't imitate those, because those are symptoms of someone who has love in these men. That humility is like a manifestation of some kind of ecstasy. Like intense humility, it's like everybody's better than me, and we think you know we're pretty much better than everybody. And you know, if you have low self-esteem, you'll desperately try to be better than everyone because you can't, because you feel so bad about yourself, and then you can become arrogant also, right? And show off just to get applause because you don't like being low. Or as pure devotee, if he's happy being low. Low is good. I guess that's enough to judge just for now. But if you can come, it's the weekend after next. We would dive into it. It's really good. You'll love it. Money back guarantee. It didn't even cost anything. How do you get a money back guarantee if it doesn't cost anything? Does it cost anything? It's cost something. Money back guarantee. What's your life? It's cost to get there. But you spend everything in your life just to get there. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna pay, and then you're gonna have to pay after and do the work. You know, apply it all. Yeah, that's the real thing. Okay, thank you very much. Should provide the entire go brahman and the very many more.